I, I thought I'd like to uh, take advantage of the time we have left to talk a little bit about awakening and insight. How much we'll be able to say, I don't know. But first of all, uh, the first slide here. Uh, awakening involves a profound shift in our intuitive understanding of reality. And that's very important to understand. That in, it's intuitive. It's not intellectual. Um, when you have an insight, it may include an intellectual understanding, but it's possible to have an insight that is the cognitive shift has occurred at a completely unconscious level and, uh, and uh, it will be only subsequently based on your experience and reflection and so forth uh, uh, and perhaps coupled with reading and discussion with a teacher that, that you actually recognize the nature of the insight that has occurred. It is a cognitive event. What do we, what do we mean by that? It, it's uh, to, to, to cognos, it means to, to know. And the shift that invol that's involved, it's, it involves a completely different way of knowing. And it's a change in a fundamental piece of, uh, of, of information that serves as a foundation for the way we construct our reality. In case you didn't already know it, each of us is living in our own world that is created by our mind. Not that there isn't something outside of your mind, because there most definitely is. Um, but your mind has created a world, and I don't know what the world is like inside any of your mind. We each live in our own universe, but the universe your mind creates that you live in is based on some certain a certain set of assumptions. Uh, the the mind, if anything, is a, a logical machine, and even the most irrational, what appears to be the most irrational uh, mental processes are actually logical. They're only irrational because of the assumptions that the logic uh, is based on. So, and this is really what happens when we become awakened, is it's a, a shift in the assumptions upon which uh, the brain's processing of information is based, the mind's processing of information. Um, awakening is uh, a culminating insight in a series of very special insights. There are five key insights. Now, this is, this is basically our left brain way of thinking, of analyzing a, a way of relating to a greater truth uh, dividing them up into seven aspects. So you should probably look at all five of these in insights as just being looking at the same thing from, a different, from different perspectives because they all, as, as we would talk about them, you see they come into, um, they, they flow into each other and, and uh, they all come to the same thing in the end. The fifth insight into the illusoriness of a separate self uh, is the culminating, culminating insight that actually brings awakening. And until, until, that, uh, until that insight occurs, you're not truly awakening. And as a matter of fact, the more other insights you have before you have that one, the more traumatic the process is going to actually be. But the whole idea of samatha is that it prepares the mind to be the ideal instrument for not only for 
uh, achieving insight, but for achieving awakening uh, relatively painlessly. Uh, as long as we cling to the notion of self, the implications of the other insights are deeply disturbing. Absolutely terrifying. They make you totally miserable. They fill you with a sense of disgust at being trapped in such a universe. They fill you with this powerful urge to escape and and if you have the wisdom you realize the only escape the only way to escape is to go forward and push through which leads to you going back and um, allowing the insights that have been so disturbing to reach a state of maturity and that's what in the progress of insight is called the knowledge of terror, the knowledge of misery, knowledge of disgust, knowledge of determination, and knowledge of, of reobservation. <laughs> but it's all because we cling to the self. Why does that happen? Yes. Um, from this point forward, uh, we're, we're talking about um, Really, when you, most people on the path of samatha, by the time they reach stage seven, um, people s start to have insight. Um, and the farther they go, the more likely they are to have insight and all of these insights and awakening. Some people will have insights much earlier on in the process, but it's fairly uncommon. And some people won't have their first insight until uh, maybe stage eight or nine or ten. But usually in, in uh, uh, progress of shamatha, uh, some degree of insight usually begins to occur around stage seven and stage eight. There's variations. As in, insight accumulates, uh, your understanding of yourself in relationship to the world changes and the effects can be enormously unsettling. Awakening is not without its price of admission. So the truth revealed by insight stands in stark contradiction to the three assumptions that are the foundation of all our beliefs and actions and our very sense of meaning and purpose in this world. I am a separate entity, a self, capital S, in a world of other distinct ent entities. And of course, I always worry about what happens to the self day to day. But another aspect of this is we fear death because um, it, it threatens the dissolution of this precious, this self that we cling to and find so precious. And so we're naturally drawn to any system of belief that promises that, that there's that the self won't die, the body will die, all kinds of other things can die, everything else can die, I don't care as long as my self doesn't die. And, and uh, my happiness and my unhappiness depend on my interactions between myself and these other entities. This is how you spend your life, right? You rely on your presumed ability to understand and predict how the world works in order to influence those interactions in a way that maximizes your happiness and minimizes your suffering. How well does it work? <laughs> so, but, but we really, the, the parts of your mind that process information and generate your world view that doesn't work all that well and contains a lot of suffering. And I'm not talking about physical pain here, I'm talking about the suffering your mind generates. Most of your, m most of the worst unpleasantness that you have experienced throughout your life has been generated by your mind and it has absolutely nothing to do with physical pain. 
even terrible physical pain, most of the terribleness of it is your mind's reaction to the physical sensation. It is not the physical sensation itself. Pain is inevitable in life. The suffering is mind generated and the wonderful thing about the science of awakening is that uh, suffering, this mind generated component, is optional. Pain's inevitable, suffering is optional. Before insight can give rise to a greater liberating truth, this old foundation has to fall away. And this is not a pleasant experience. I mean, it's like taking one of these skyscrapers and you're going to replace the foundation, right? While leaving the rest intact. <laughs> um, you would not want to be given that job. Right? Um, and the emotional distress it produces can, can be extreme. Okay. But my promise to you is that the training in Samatha and the Eightfold Path will spare you most of the trauma associated with awakening. And I, I stress the Eightfold Path because this book is mostly about meditation. Although throughout the book, I'm trying to disengage you from the notion that there, that you are a self, that you are a separate, that, you're th that there's anybody in control, that there's anybody doing things. And the more, the more you pick up on that cue in your meditation, those cues in your meditation, and the more that you, you experientially verify that in fact that, that um, thinking happens, feelings happen, uh, all everything happens, but, uh, and, and you are a person, but there is no agent who is a part of this person that is making this happen. That, you know, uh, meditation is mind training, but you don't train your mind. The mind trains itself. You don't decide to meditate. The mind, or parts of your mind, because your mind is very multi-parted, -part um, uh, Enough parts of your mind have decided to meditate that meditation happens. Um, but even that particular collection of parts of your mind can't be referred to as you because they're just mental processes and they're mental processes made up of other mental processes and they only happen to join the Let's Meditate Club because of causes and conditions that led to those sub-processes coming to the same place. You get the, the picture? So, uh, so what, what we're trying to do, uh, what I'm trying to do in, uh, in, in this book is to help you to use the information that's staring you in the face every time you find that you can't do what you thought you could do with your mind to realize that there ain't no you there to begin with. And that's why there is just your mind. Okay. These, let's look at these insights. Insight into impermanence. You know, they speak of there being three gateways into uh, meditation or into awakening. And I'll explain what that means is that uh, typically what happens there is one insight that opens the door for the other insights. And so it serves as the gateway. And then when all of the, when all of the insights have, have been achieved and received, uh, have uh, achieved a certain uh, degree of maturity, and they won't be completely mature, that won't happen until you become an arhat, fourth path, or even beyond that. There's a continuing process of maturation of these insights. But not until you have all of these insights and they've achieved a sufficient degree of maturation and you're actually in a state of equanimity uh, will 
awakening occur. That equanimity is extremely important. Um, awakening only occurs in a state with a, of tranquility and equanimity corresponding to shamatha. If you take a dry in, the dry insight practice, for example, for those of you who are familiar with it, the 14th uh, stage in the progress of insight is the knowledge of equanimity towards formations. That is tranquility and equanimity. That is a form, a version of samatha. So you only achieve awakening when you have sufficient equanimity and you also have uh, the, these insights have matured sufficiently. And it occurs at an unconscious level. That's the important level. The intellectual understanding is, as I said before, it's a helpful thing to have because the unconscious mental processes can then uh, use this as a reference point uh, in, in establishing a new foundation for perce your perception of yourself and your reality. But consciousness itself is not even necessary and requisite to awakening. It have, what, what is intuition? Intuition is knowledge that comes into consciousness from the unconscious mind. And so the source of all intuition and what is intuitive are the unconscious processes that give rise to the information that rises into consciousness. I said before in that diagram, consciousness is a very small part of the mind. Consciousness is essentially just information exchange by all of the different unconscious components of your mind. That's really all it is. And if we examine the information processing capacity, uh, the, the bit rate of consciousness, it's very low. There are billions of bits of information uh, being generated by your body and by different parts of your brain in, in, every, uh, in every second. The uh, there have been attempts to measure the bit rate of uh, consciousness. They've all made the mistake of measuring the bit rate of attention, which is serial, rather than the bit rate of, uh, of consciousness as a whole, which uh, includes the result of a lot of parallel processing. But the bit rate of, the bit rate of uh, attention, of information processing, compared to the billions of bits of information that are being produced in the mind in every moment from the sense organs and from the mind itself is in the order of uh, estimates. Uh, some estimates run as low as, as 20 or 30. I think that's an underestimate. Um, bottom range of about 40 bits per second up to maybe 80 bits per second. So consciousness is not really terribly important although it's the only tool we have to use to get here, okay? But when the awakening happens, all the important action is happening, in terms of insight and awakening both, all the important action is happening um, in the unconscious level. And, um, and then you become conscious of the fruits of it afterwards. Right. So let's look at them individually, impermanence. I have talked about this before, so I'll just be repeating myself, but your, your standard worldview is that things come into existence, they have a period in which they are uh, self-existent, uh, and then uh, they arose due to causes and conditions, they have a period of persistence, and then due to causes and conditions, they pass away. And we focus on a world consisting of things which are um, that period of persistence between the arising and passing away. As the insight into impermanence 
develops, you begin to know. You may know consciously, but what's important is you see at an unconscious level that in fact there are no things. That the arising and the passing away, there's the arising and the passing away and there's no persistence in between. Except that that's not even true. And that's, the, that's not impermanent. That's getting close to impermanence. It's when you realize that arising and passing away are only an illusion that is secondary. It's necessitated by the illusion that we've already dropped, that there was a thing that was in a period of endurance between the arising and passing away. Once there is nothing to persist between the arising and passing away, then the arising and passing away themselves dissolve into meaningless and then you achieve insight into impermanence, which is that there is only process. That's insight into impermanence. Emptiness. Emptiness is the insight that realizes that everything, everything that appears in consciousness is a, co a construct of your own mind. It's a mental fabrication. Um, the closest that we can get in terms of conscious events to, uh, uh, to something that is not a mental fabrication is a kind of mental fabrication that we would call a sense percept or in the language of uh, uh, cognitive science, we refer to it as a qualia, Q-U-A-L-I-A. -A. That's something like the color blue or red or the taste of salty or sweet or the feeling of warmth or coolness. The, these are, are qualia or qualia sometimes pronounced. I, I prefer qualia because the, the word is closer to quality, right? So I pronounce, I, I like to pronounce it qualia, but. Um, or another way of describing it is sense percepts. Are these real or are these mental constructs? They are mental constructs. The color red is created in your mind. It does not exist in the world. What exists in the world is electromagnetic radiation of a particular frequency that breaks down certain pigments in the retina of your eye which causes certain neurons to fire and go to a part of your brain that creates the color red. The color red does not exist in the world. For that matter, your red may be my blue and you and I would never know because we point to the same thing and we give it the same name. For, for that matter, your color red may be my salty but uh, we would never know because every time you point to a red thing and say that's red, I have the experience that you would call salty and, and I say, yep, you're right, that's red. These are mental constructs. There is absolutely no component of our uh, conscious experience that is not generated by our mind. Now, let's not slip into uh, hyper-idealistic solipsism uh, that does not mean that nothing exists outside your mind. Something, there is something corresponding to what we call electromagnetic radiation, which is only a fiction that we've created to explain our experience. There is something out there and it follows its own laws and it somehow interacts uh, with our mind to trigger our mind to generate red or saltiness, or warmth, or coolness, or things like that. So, emptiness is not stating an ontological fact that nothing exists. It's stating an epistemological fact that absolutely nothing that arises in your mind is, has a self-nature of being what it is. It is something constructed by your mind in response to something that's outside of your mind. After all, you think about it, all of the sensory information that enters your brain 
is identical in form. It's, a, it's an electrical impulse traveling along a nerve fiber. And the only thing that differentiates one from another is its origin and its destination, right? So, then your brain, mind, takes that information and uh, it, it creates a world from it. Think about yourself as an infant. You didn't know, you didn't have a world, but an analogy that I give. Imagine, imagine you're in a room and the walls are covered by banks of colored lights blinking on and off. You've got some levers and buttons in front of you and you have absolutely no idea what any of this means. But gradually you begin to discern patterns in the blinking of the lights. And then you notice when you push certain buttons or you pull certain levers that it changes the patterns in the lights. And some of the patterns you like and some of them you don't and so forth. That's kind of like an infant, right? And sensory information comes in and it begins to create uh, meaning out of, out of it. Uh, and the infant, the things like, uh, first of all, the infant cries but not intentionally and then a good thing happens. There's a sensation of uh, warm milk, soft breast, uh, relief of, of hunger, so on and so forth. But gradually it starts to become intentional, you know, it's like, like the little man in the box we described starts to push buttons and pull levers and say, oh, when I push this button, that good thing happens. When I pull this lever, that bad thing happens. Right? That's what emptiness is, the realization that everything is a fabrication of the mind. And we combine that with impermanence and we say whatever whatever it is that's outside of my mind that my mind is a part of is only process and the world that I live in uh, this part of the larger process has created for itself in order to explain in its own limited way um, what that larger process is. And um, another really important insight is the causal interdependence of all phenomena. Absolutely everything is causally interdependent. And I, I'll use the uh, analogy that um, people who have listened to my talks are tired of, which is there is at this moment in Hong Kong a cockroach. And you are sitting in this room listening to me. Now that event in Hong Kong and this event here, let's just take yourself as an example. You being here and hearing me is a result of causes and conditions. Not some linear chain of causality. But there is a, are a huge number of immediate causes and conditions that were necessary for you to be here right this instant. And every single one of those is dependent upon a similarly huge number of causes and conditions that had to be just so for that to be true. And that in turn. So if you sitting here is this event, and this is the past, there is this expanding, very rapidly expanding cone of causality that encompasses, it, it expands very rapidly. It, it ultimately encompasses the entire universe. The same is true of that cockroach in Hong Kong. And its cone of causality intersects with your cone of causality. That means if that cockroach didn't exist in Hong Kong, right in the place that it is right now, doing whatever it's doing right now, you probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> causal interdependence. And the other thing about causal interdependence is that 
it is the realization that nothing stands outside of causal interdependence. Something may seem like magic, something may seem supernatural, but something is only supernatural because we don't understand how it, uh, the causal factors that cause it to be. If you took if you took a cell phone back to somebody in the 1950s and demonstrated it for them, they'd be, they'd be pretty amazed. What if you took it back to somebody in the 1500s? They'd swear it was magic. You took it back to somebody two or three thousand years ago and you're God, let me worship you. You know, you, magic. Um, insight into causal interdependence frees us from the illusions of, uh, and, and delusions that uh, there's anything that is separate. Anything that we're not a part of the whole, anything that we're not, that was not subject to causal influences of everything else, or anything that could act and its action not produce causal consequences, would be totally irrelevant. Maybe there are such things in some alternative universe which we're completely separate from. But everything that everything in this universe, everything in the universe that you create in your mind, uh, if it were if it is accurate, then it will include the basic assumption that everything is interconnected, uh, is causally interconnected, because in fact, whatever the mystery is that lies out there beyond our sense organs is 100% totally causally connected. So let's throw the supernatural off the window and call it what it is. It's something that we don't understand yet. But once we do understand it, we're going to find that it's totally understand, it's, it's completely, be, uh, it fits in perfectly with everything else that we do know, right? All right. Um, the nature of suffering, the form that that insight takes, what, what that insight consists of, really, is that as long as I think I'm a separate self, in a world that is only process that my understanding of is the invention of my own limited mind. And one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about the emptiness is the way your mind creates its reality is a result of your conditioning. I mean, not that we come into this world as a blank slate exactly because we have, we have some hardwired predispositions for sure. But from that basis, it's all of the things that happened to us and everything that we did in response to them that conditioned your mind to be the way it is right now and to have created the universe that you live in right now. When you, when you realize there is only process and when you realize that the only things that you know are fabrications of your own mind, then the idea that you can ever understand things well enough and manipulate the world successfully enough to truly be happy and avoid all suffering crumbles totally, right? You, you, you're like a minnow trying to push the Titanic. And emptiness says, you don't know nothing. And nothing is what you need to know. <laughs> Causal interdependence and so forth. So this is really, this is, when you have these other insights and you still believe that you are a separate self, this is where the terror, misery, and disgust come from, right? That's not a nice place to be. But when you realize that you are not a separate self, that the self was an illusion, that the self was empty. 
it is totally liberating. Right? There, it, it, is, it is totally liberating. You cease to cling, and when you cease to cling and you cease to crave, you cease to suffer. You, your mind ceases to generate that suffering which characterizes human existence. Uh, the Buddha said that uh, our lives are full of suffering. Basically, the first noble truth is that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. The second truth is that craving, based on the illusion that we are a separate self, is the cause of all our suffering. That's why our mind generates this state of uh, unhappiness, of suffering, is because it's it's clinging to this false illusion that there's a separate self and that your happiness and unhappiness come from outside of you and that you have some chance of manipulating the world to make yourself happy, you know, and it's not true. But when you replace that, now see the one in the middle, the causal interdependence of all phenomena means that you are a part of everything, inseparably. And impermanence is telling you the same thing. And emptiness is defining your relationship to it. And now, instead of being in a terrible place, you find your non-self as a process that is a part of a much, much greater process. And you realize that the greatest knowledge that you can have is to know that you don't know, right? And when you realize that the world that you are living in is created by your own mind, you become enormously empowered because you can change the way your mind creates the world. As a matter of fact, that change happens as soon as you have these insights. As soon as you have the insight into the fact that you are not a separate self, then the world that your mind creates is completely different. Because you've changed the fundamental assumptions by which the mind processes information and the product that is generated in the end is different. And the third noble truth is that uh, a complete and total end of suffering is possible if you overcome the delusion that gives rise to craving, since, it is, since craving is the immediate cause of suffering, and since the delusion that you're a separate self in a world of separate objects and that your happiness and unhappiness come from your interaction, um, the, that is the delusion that gives rise to the craving. So a complete and total end of suffering is possible when, uh, you're in, when every part of your mind is no longer functioning uh, based on that delusion and instead functions based on the wisdom that is, that is described uh, in terms of these insights. That's what awakening is. That's what liberation is. And that's the, the goal that we're, that we're after. So you notice how key certain things are to this. The reason that we go through life not knowing the truth of impermanence is that there's a part of our mind that constructs things. It takes, it takes our experience, both sensory and the internally generated experience of our own mind-brain, and it fragments it, and it labels those fragment, that fragments. So there's, there's a part of your brain that takes information and it 
fragments that information into a world of things. And then, on the basis of your accumulated conditioning and, and knowledge and experience, it imputes a particular nature to each one of those things. Interesting thing is that this fellow over here might find the same thing that I find terrible and ugly might find beautiful and wonderful. Because the nature that his mind imputes to that thing is, that is just a creation of his mind anyway, that uh, to the degree that his conditioning is different than mine and his experiences are different than mine, you know, he sees it one way and I see another, it another way. Now we're all similar enough that the same, as the same parts of our brain are going to see rocks as rocks. But the more complex the thing that we're examining is, the more it's going to differ from one person to another. One of the most complex things that we have as a part of our environment are other people. And isn't it amazing how different we all perceive the same person, how differently we perceive the same person. For that matter, the way I perceive myself bears very, very little relationship to the way any of you see me, right? But the same is true. Every single one of you is perceiving me uh, differently in many, many ways. And you can acknowledge that. I don't need to demonstrate it for you. But your mind imputes a nature. It first, it constructs a thing out of the flow of information. And then it imputes a particular nature to that thing. And part of that is its desirability and its undesirability. One of the things that your mind has separated out of the flow is the self. You know, the narrative center of gravity of the part of the mind that uh, it, it's really a it's really a memory function. It's a short-term memory bank that that generates episodic memory that gets stored elsewhere and can be recalled. Um, but for that story to make sense for minds like ours, uh, it has to have a there has to be a narrative center of gravity, and that's the I, that's the self. But this same part of our mind makes that I into something real and concrete and something that we can be very fearful of losing, and something that we can cherish greatly, and, uh, and the whole thing goes on, and uh, uh, if we're not happy, but we think having something else will make us happy, then craving arises, and if we get that thing, we might be happier for a short period of time until we lose that thing, or until the, the ability of any, anything, any, any event or anything that we get to make us happy is limited. It wears off. It, it, the, the same thing doesn't keep making you happy, right? In, 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 this, game, um, uh, in this game that we're trying to play, we just can't win. Even when we get what we want, we eventually lose it, and often before we've even lost it, it no longer makes us happy. Not to mention the fact that a lot of time, by the time we've gotten it, the cost was way, was, was way higher than what it's actually worth to begin with. So we're off pursuing something else that we think is going to make us happy. And we can tell the same story about all the things that make us unhappy. And, uh, but the truth is, where is the happiness and unhappiness coming from? When you got the thing that you wanted, where did the little burst of happiness, uh, of, of happierness, uh, come from? Did it come from the thing? Was it inherent in the thing? Was it inherent in the relationship between you as five aggregates and, and, and the thing? No. It's something that was generated in your mind purely in response to the mind's own fantasy. 
right? So, there's a part of your mind that in order to take the things that it has generated with the natures that it has imputed to them, um, that simplifies the reality down to a linear kind of causality. Acorns cause oak trees, and it disregards everything else. And, and oak trees live for sometimes hundreds of years, right? Persist for a long time. The same part of your brain that's doing that is, uh, is, is reducing causality to something linear. And anything that it can't explain, it attributes to the supernatural or makes it magical. And uh, all of these things apply to the self. And in the whole process, your mind spends a whole lot of time generating suffering for all of the reasons that you've all heard about before. In the game of life, when it comes to suffering versus happiness, you can't win and you can't break even. But you can get out of the game. And that's what this is about. Now, I th if, you, if we go back to, let's, let's go back to awareness and attention, okay? Now, these are perceptual phenomena arising in consciousness. But there's a massive amount of information processing that is going on that gives rise to these two perceptual modes. And these two perceptual modes are distinct from each other because a different kind of processing is taking place. Even though it's the, much of the information it starts with is the same. Um, so, so the what that it's doing is the same, but how it's doing it is different. Now, you've probably all heard about, you know, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere and how different they are from each other. And we're going to use that as a metaphor. I mean, the truth is, there's some truth in that. There are certain mental functions that are, that, that are predominantly uh, originate in one hemisphere or the other and the specific uh, specific portions of the neural circuitry that um, generate the particular characteristics that you've heard listed as right brain and left brain. The truth though is that um, even even the most lateralized things that we know about like language, are not confined to one hemisphere. But we can still metaphorically say, since, since a lot of the core activity for certain kinds of mental processing occur in the right hemisphere, and they're different than the kinds of core processing occur, occur in, in the left hemisphere, we can speak of this metaphorically while knowing that all of the neuroscientists are going to cringe and say, it's not really like that. <laughs> but that's all right. This is enough of a truth, and everybody's familiar with it enough that, um, that we can use it. And um, these th I think things that we're talking the the part of your brain that um, breaks things down into parts, that creates things out of process, is very left brainish, right? So we we'll just call it left brain. Okay. The left hemisphere of your mind breaks things down into parts. 
and breaks the parts down into parts and it imputes nature to the parts at the different levels. And this is an absolutely wonderful thing because it allows us to analyze, it allows us to create, it allows us to, to make tools and use them, it allows us to invent, it allows us to figure out how things work, it allows us to fix things that don't work, it allows us to create things to do jobs that never existed before. It's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful faculty. And it's only able to do this because it takes the information and it processes it by breaking, breaking the inf by, by chunking the information, putting labels on it and things, uh, imputing particular natures to th to those things and then it can manipulate them and play with them and, and do all kinds of wonderful things. We are so fortunate to have this capacity and we have this capacity to a degree that no other uh, animal that we know of, uh, I mean we can't, we don't know enough about whales and dolphins and things like that but in terms of all the terrestrial animals whose brains we've studied and can, uh, you know, w we have this capacity to a degree that's completely unprecedented in evolutionary history. It's wonderful. What a great gift. It's allowed us to, I mean, look what we've done. My God. How can we question it? Look at science. The things that we can say about the origins and history of the universe and the behavior of matter at, uh, uh, at supra, super sub-microscopic scales and the quantum behavior of things, uh, you know. This is all the result of the same part of our brain that creates these problems. Isn't that interesting? Now, what does the right hemisphere do? it sees things holistically, right? Holes. Even when it's given pieces, it makes them into holes. And it is. In a properly functioning brain, the two sides are talking to each other. And this is tremendous too. Um, it just turns out that the processing that's done by the right hemisphere is a closer approximation to the way the great mystery outside of our mind operates. Because we can't really know what lies beyond our senses except through inference. But what we know through inference and even through science, the left, our left brains through science have figured out that the nature of the great mystery out there is that it, it is process. And it fi it's figured out science and, and scientists and philosophers have discovered the truth of emptiness and they've discovered the truth of no self. All of these wonderful insights are now a part of the intellectual property of uh, human culture that has been developed and, uh, by the left brain. But it remains as an intellectual thing. We continue to see the world in terms of the left brain paradigm. We don't see ourselves as nearly as interconnected as we should. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you is that, let's put it in terms of natures, that we have two distinct natures. Okay, human nature. And those two natures are out of balance. The right hemisphere is actually a little bit bigger than the left. And the assumptions that it works on when it processes information are actually more accurate in terms of whatever ultimate truth is. But it has gotten to be suppressed because 
the left brain functions have been so wonderfully successful. And we've progressed, and this is a cultural phenomenon, because we're born with the same brains that we had um, before this, this ever happened. You know, I, I'm suggesting to you that this change in the way that our brains work probably started, sort of had its beginnings with the Cultural Revolution and really got, it really hit a high degree of momentum about 5,000 years ago. And now in the digital era of, uh, uh, that includes the, the capitalist era and all of these other things, basically all of the problems that we face in the world are the dark side of the side of our brain and the kind of information processing that has also uh, contributed so enormously to our success. But let us not neglect the role of the right brain in this. In addition to being capable of this kind of analysis and tool use and creativity and building and everything else that we have, we are also the most highly social species in the world. As the left brain grew and developed, so did the right brain. And although we live in a left brain dominated culture that tells us, that tries to tell us there is no such thing as altruism, that there is only enlightened self-interest, and that's your best case. And the way that the world functions is on the assumption that nobody ever does anything except for their own personal benefit. And so if you want people to do good, you figure out a way that they get rewarded, somehow or another. And that even, even do-gooders who go around being do-gooders only do it because it makes them feel good. Not because, I mean, this, this, this is what our culture tells us. It's not because they see us all as interconnected and all part of one greater process. But the fact is that a lot of people do. Some people, their right brain hasn't been suppressed to quite the same degree. We use both. Uh, we couldn't have this if we didn't cooperate enormously. We could have this tremendous left brain and can you imagine what individual human beings or small groups of individual human beings, how far their technology would have advanced? As a matter of fact, there's all kinds of other things. I mean, if we didn't cooperate and work together uh, we, we couldn't have used these capabilities to create and do what we have. But and we, we couldn't have come to the place of dominance. We are the dominant species on this planet, unfortunately for us and for the rest of the planet. But nevertheless, it's true, and this is how it came about. But it didn't come about only because of that. It came about because we work together and we support each other. And there were evolutionary forces that forced that to happen. Um, we have a, an enormous period of time after we're born where we're totally incapable of taking care of ourselves. Yet we intuitively and instinctively, well, let's translate that. There's a whole part of our mind that makes sure and there's a whole part of our brain that has evolved so that we have that part of our mind that makes sure that we care for the young. We not only care for the young, we care for the old. Now you can see that caring for the young is beneficial, right? Because then they can take care of us when we get old. But then the question is, why would they bother? Because old people aren't any use, but they're a lot of trouble to take care of, but we do it anyway. Another thing. 
there is, tell me another organism you know of that spends so much of its life in states of sickness and survives with the degree of injury that human beings do. Do you have dogs and cats? You know, do they get flus and colds and every year? Do they get infections every time they get bit or cut or scraped? Or but we do. I'm not sure why that's the case, but I'm really sure of one thing, that we would not survive if we didn't take care of each other. And why do we do that? Well, you can come up with some nice left brain, pro-capitalist, pro-selfish uh, uh, explanations that cover it to a certain degree. But we go way beyond what can be explained by that. It's almost as if part of us knows that we're all one. It's as if part of us is already awakened. It's as if we have a Buddha nature that possesses all of this wisdom, but it's so deeply buried under this powerful, powerful left brain view of the world and reality that we actually have to work to bring it out. So this puts attention and awareness in a totally new context, doesn't it? When you are taming attention and when you are developing powerful awareness and particularly introspective metacognitive introspective awareness that's capable of seeing the universe within as it really is and its relationship to the universe outside of itself, you're developing that part of your mind that sees and understands interconnectedness and interdependence and operates from that place. You're moving closer to being an awakened being, aren't you? Through developing awareness. And what does it mean to be an awakened being? Well, you still are capable of seeing yourself as separate. The only difference is you know it's not true and you only do it when it's necessary. When it comes time to sort your laundry from somebody else's, you know, you take it all out of the washing machine, you can do the I, me, mine thing, which is really great. Life flows much more smoothly that way, right? The, uh, the underwear you take home actually fit you. It's always there, but we no longer believe in it to the extent that it becomes the source of our craving and our suffering, right? It allows us, when, when we dwell in a place of seeing the wholeness and interconnectedness of everything, we're not dependent upon our own temporary happierness when we get something we want. All of the happiness in the world becomes ours. Of the Brahma Viharas, that is what's called sympathetic joy. That is something that when you, when you relieve the suppression of the right brain by the left brain, and you begin to dwell in the place of, of a perception of things more as they really are, it also gives you access to a tremendous amount of pleasure and happiness. And in the process, you discovered along the way that both suffering and joy 
or products of your own mind. In the samatha practice, you find joy arises that has absolutely nothing to do with anything outside of yourself. You find happiness that comes entirely, that you find that happiness is just another one of those mental constructs. And not only that, you learn how to turn the tap on and off. You learn how to turn off the suffering tap and turn on the happiness tap. We do that in the jhana practice as well. The first jhana is characterized by attention plus joy and happiness. We get rid of attention when we move into the second jhana and we have joy and happiness. Joy is a mental state that produces happiness. Joy is a mental state that biases our perception towards the positive, right? And the result is happiness. We move into the third jhana and we've just got the happiness. We don't even need to create a mental state that perceives things in a particular way in order to have happiness. We discover that the mind can create the happiness on its own. And then the fourth jhana, we we find that there's something even more sublime than that. And that is equanimity. So happiness, unhappiness flows right through us. So these practices, they're not only leading us towards awakening, they are awakening us. And what's happening inside our minds is that this one nature that really has the characteristics that we attribute to an awakened mind or a Buddha, this aspect of our nature is being developed, it's being enhanced. And this other aspect of our nature, which is so powerfully useful, except that when it gets in control, it makes us miserable and and we create misery for a lot of other people, it gets tamed. It remains there. We have all of the utility of it. But it's no longer in charge. And as a result, we become much happier. Those around us become much happier. And if it happened with enough of us, the whole world would become a better place. We might stand a chance to solve some of the major problems that we've created for ourselves that we face today. So I'm suggesting to you, really, that there is a uh, neurophysiological basis for awakening. That what's happened to you is you came into this world and you became strongly acculturated so that uh, many of the left, uh, right brain functions became minimized due to inhibition from the left hemisphere. And that the left hemisphere became dominant. This became reinforced throughout your life. And you became trained to do and to think and feel in this way. Uh, One thing I didn't mention was language and symbolic thinking. Language is a kind of very powerful kind of symbolic thinking. Mental imagery is another kind of symbolic thinking. Um, Somatosensory uh, uh, or or somesthetic mental experiences, internally generated somesthetic experiences are another kind of symbolic thinking. Just as an image or a word, uh, a somesthetic feeling that's generated in your mind, condenses a huge amount of information into something that is a symbol that is not the thing in itself. And um, symbolic thinking is characteristic of the left hemisphere. After all, that's where the speech centers are located, right? And that's where we do arithmetic. Actually, we do mathematics in the right brain, but we do arithmetics in the left brain. Because mathematics, I don't know how many of you are familiar with mathematics as opposed to arithmetic. But mathematics requires, it requires 
the larger perspective in which the, the sequential uh, analytical process can take place. Um, well, you've all learned algebra, right? So you've got the big picture, and then you do the arithmetic inside the big picture. But if you didn't have the big picture, you'd never know how to you'd solve the problem, right? The first time you were confronted with a quadratic equation in high school, you know, you could beat your brains to pieces, but then when you were given the ability to see the big picture, then you could manipulate the pieces inside that and solve the problems, and next you learn calculus, and so on and so forth. So, what we are learning to do when we meditate is to bring this part of our nature forward and to tame this other part of our nature. Neurologically, what we're doing is causing a reorganization and rewiring of the brain so there's a lot less inhibition of right brain functions and they come to dominate more our daily perceptions of reality in ourselves. Um, when you open your eyes in the morning, rather than seeing a world that consists of separate things that are either desirable or undesirable and that you have to struggle uh, to obtain or to avoid and so on and so forth, you open your eyes into a world of wholeness and um, uh, 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 of happiness and of potential happiness and you can put your other faculties together uh, put to work to reduce the suffering that you see around you and other people and the pain that's in the world that doesn't need to be there and that's what it means to be a wise and compassionate awakened being that's what it means to bring your Buddha nature forward so there you go. That's what my next book is about. You know, this is all secular too, I'll point out to you. Um, I mean, after all, truth doesn't belong to any particular system of thought or philosophy or religion. And what we're talking about here is, is truth. We're talking about a greater approximation to an ultimate truth that's taking place. And none of the things that the Buddha taught, that the Buddha really taught, um, need to be understood from the point of view of religion. The Buddha Dharma became religion and a lot of good things came from that and it probably wouldn't have preserved and been preserved and lasted as long as it did. Remember the Buddha himself predicted it wouldn't last very long. But the Buddha did not create a religion out of it. People created religion out of it afterwards and now it persists, right? Created many different religions out of it, the Buddha Dharma. But we have this Buddha Dharma. And the, the working title for my next book is Contemporary Dharma. Um, oh, I can't remember, what's the subtitle? A blueprint, a blueprint for the salvation of humanity, right? And the word humanity has two meanings, as in the human species and also uh, as in humanitarian behavior, it, it's our humanness, our humanity. And that all of that right brain stuff out of which loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy come, that's our humanity. That's our true humanity. The left brain stuff is like computers, like machines. It's, you know, and it's really good. It's great. It's, it's a great tool. But our humanity dwells in the right hemisphere functions. And so um, what I'm talking to you about is a dharma that's, that's naturalized in other words, you strip out all the supernatural components because they don't really add anything anyway. They don't help. They just create problems. So it's modernized and it's brought into a way of understanding that and a language that 
everyone out there on the street is capable of understanding. And if enough people understand it, and if it's applied through the methods that accompany it, then the world will change. And perhaps it will change in time for us to um, survive as a species, although I think we'll probably survive as a species anyway. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we'll, we'll preserve all of the wonderful things that uh, our culture has developed or that we will survive as, uh, as beings that are, have, have our right and left hemispheres functioning in, in a more appropriate balance than before. <laughs>